Uh, turn now to the book of 2 John. <clears throat> We're going to be reading all 13 verses of 2 John. And during the message, we'll be focusing primarily on verses 7 through 11, but we will read the whole passage. Hear now the word of our Lord. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in, tr in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Thus far the reading of the Lord's word. Uh, real briefly, I bring greetings from Escondido United Reformed Church, and it is uh, good to be here. Uh, so 2 John, uh, if, if we're all honest with their, each other, we probably have not spent a lot of time with 2 John. Just think the last time you might have heard a sermon in the book of 2 John. Probably if you have, it was a long time ago. Uh, chances are probably not. And for many Christians, there is this tendency to overlook certain books of the Bible. Uh, certainly some books appeal to us more. Uh, really, they, through the Spirit, it just, it, there's more that gets into our hearts. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, what we know is the Word of God, all of it, is beneficial to us. So sometimes we can overlook a book like 2 John. But... One of the things that we come to when we read this is that it still has much to say to us today. This letter was written to a church or to some churches that the John the Apostle was dealing with. Uh, we don't know particularly how closely involved, but there was enough relationship there that he had standing and authority over them to write such a letter uh, to them. It's not, however, just a letter, though, that's living in its own time. See, when we come to this letter, what we see is evidence of perpetual things that were plaguing the church then that continued on today, as we'll find out a little bit more, um, namely the heretical teachings and false teachings concerning our Lord. But more importantly, more importantly, we are given a timeless truth for us to know and follow as those who are in Christ. And this timeless teaching is rooted in one of old. It's rooted in the commandment to love one another. John wrote this letter to show what the love for God and love for neighbor looks like. And what we have here is an application of the commandment to love one another that is by protecting each other in the truth. The three points to that we're going to consider this morning uh, to, to put this together are this is being done by our awareness of the field of battle or the battlefield, the stakes and the actions. Uh, I'll repeat those points because I know when I'm taking a message in, I like to hear them again. The battlefield, the stakes, and the actions. 
So when we come to this passage or come to the focus that we're going to have starting at verse 7, it's good, though, to know where we're at, orient ourselves. In verses 1 through 6, John has written to the church, and he's, he's encouraging them. Uh, he's greatly rejoiced, or he rejoices greatly to find out that some of the children are walking in the church, truth. And it fills him with joy because he's preparing what he's going to talk about later. It's not something that they necessarily, you know, needed to hear because they were worried about if they were or not. But he's just trying to, to build them up. He's trying to say, hey, you're doing a good job. Keep doing it. What we have with, or what we can take away when we see him talk about the truth, and he talks about it multiple times here in the first few verses, but also it's full in his gospel and in uh, also First John, is this idea of the truth. And the truth really is embodied in, in Christ and who he is. And really, when we step back and think about it even more, we come to see that his love for the truth, or when he speaks of loving in the truth and love for the truth, it's ultimately rooted in loving God. And I think that's an important thing to, to keep in mind is basically John touches on both sides of the law here. He touches on loving God, and he's touching on loving one another, which we're going to look more in-depthly at. So after this commendation for, and, and just being thrilled to hear how they're doing, he moves to remind them of the commandment to love one another. And this is rooted again in Christ's teaching. John 13, 34, I give to you a new commandment to love one another. But notice, he also says that it's not, John says, it's not a new commandment. And really, when we go back to uh, the Old Testament, we see in Leviticus 19.18, the command to love your neighbor as yourself. So this is something that has existed in the church ever since the beginning. This is not something that's novel or new. So building off of this rooted th or these rooted things that John has put, building off of that, he goes in to what we're going to focus mainly on today starting in verse 7, just to read it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. One of the things John is doing here is he's trying to make them aware of what's going on. He's warning the church of deceivers that they exist, and they are those who do not confess Christ as coming in the flesh. This is where this idea of being aware of the battlefield that we're, I'm working with this morning, that's where this comes in. Consider military leaders and all the strategizing that they have to do. Specifically, we can think of our own nation's history. If you've ever read anything about the preparation to the invasion of Normandy, one of the things that stands out is the amount of time and preparation that went into it. Uh, from the time that the attack on Pearl Harbor happened and, and the country declared war, uh, it was a few years. And this planning was so in-depth and so big. But one of the core things that was going into this planning was not just the training up of the men and the preparing and the planning of the missions, but there was an advanced awareness that these leaders had of knowing who their enemy was and what, his, what the enemy's capabilities were or or what they do. This is what John's doing right here. See, it was common knowledge to some degree back then amongst the Christians that yes, there were these false teachers that were going around. John is not necessarily trying to bring new intel here, but he's still making them aware that, hey, you gotta be on the lookout for this. These false teachers, they were willfully teaching false things. What we're talking about here is not someone like Apollos. If you recall in the book of Acts, Apollos, who is teaching about the things of God, Priscilla and Aquila come up to him, and then they have to correct him, specifically because he was doing, all he knew was John's baptism. Priscilla and Aquila, though, corrected him, commended him, and sent him on his way. And we know that Apollos continued to serve faithfully, teaching the truth. Apollos had a humble but just slightly misguided uh, knowledge of what he was teaching, but his heart was there. He was not out for himself. Conversely, though, what we have are false teachers, as I said, 
who were openly defiant to the apostles' teaching. An example, if you were to look over at 3 John, is John talks specifically about those that were ignoring the instructions coming from the apostles. It was not a matter of people just not having the right information and the right beliefs. Uh, not through willfulness, as in like Apollos, but it was rather these were intentional things that were going on. So as this is not necessarily new intelligence that John is giving to these churches, he's actually prodding them to vigilance. He's saying, stay awake. See, one of the most dangerous kinds of danger that exists, or most, kind, most dangerous kinds of evil that exists, sorry, is deception. Deception is very subtle. It comes in, and part of it is it seems like it's actually true. It seems like it's good. You've heard the saying, wolves in sheep's clothing. What John is talking about here is the epitome of that. He's talking about dealing with the wee wolves in sheep's clothing. So how does it work? Well, these individuals, when they would come, they would have enough good teaching that they would earn a hearing, enough good teaching that it sounded like they were in accord with what the apostles were teaching. They probably had some smooth talk that was going on, and they were building this toleration for themselves. They were not being challenged. They were not being rebuked. And as this happened, it took a hold. And, thing, and as it took a hold, it grew and grew, and churches would drift and drift away. And that was the danger that John had in mind. Coming into our day, uh, if you know anything of the history of the United Reformed Church, you know that the church spawns out of faithful men who were vigilant, seeing that there were some errors that were going on, and they needed to take action. So what they were doing was in accordance with what John is talking about right here. Now, what was the particular problem that John is addressing in this letter? What was actually going on? The problem was that of Christology, or just the theology of knowing who Christ is. Uh, you can think of specifically here his two natures, his divine nature and his human nature. This particular issue, that of Christology, was very common in the first few centuries of the church. If you were to go back and look at the first heretics that are listed within Christianity, or heretics that Christians deemed heretics, you would find that it is almost all of them early on in the first few centuries, it was because of their views on Christ that they were deemed heretics. It's why we have our confessions such as our Apostles' Creed that we say, our Nicene Creed, even more so. And then if you look through the forms, uh, you'll also see the Chalcedonian Creed. All those are rooted in this problem and identifying those problems. So why is it a major issue, though, that someone was coming and teaching about Christ? They might have been teaching very positive things about Christ and who he was, but not teaching that he came in the flesh. Well, one thing right off the bat is it undermined our Lord and what he taught. It undermined what Jesus came and professed about himself. See, at this time, there would have been enough eyewitnesses to give testimony about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It was still close enough to when all of Jesus' earthly ministry was going on that this letter would have been written. Also, it's very possible that even some of the Gospels might have been circulating by this time. So there could have been even ability to read about who Jesus was and hear his teaching. I'll focus more on the Apostles' teaching in a second, but that's also in the backdrop here. But needless to say, is Christ himself claimed that he was both God and man. This was very core to what the Apostles' teaching were. Specifically, with Jesus' humanity, consider his suffering. His suffering on earth. He, he experienced the common things that you and I do. He was thirsty. We know that he fasted for 40 days. In that fasting, he would have been weak from hunger. Uh, recently, I can tell you that I've learned that 
hangriness has to do with blood sugar levels. Uh, so I like to make sure that I have a little something in my stomach all the time. I can only imagine what 40 days would have been like for me without that. So we know that there's a toll that that would have taken on, not just in weakness. But more importantly is that only true flesh and blood could atone for the sins of man. So what's going on here then is by not saying that Jesus lived in the flesh, saying, sure, he came. You're not just making Christ, and I'm going to explain a little bit more with the apostles here in a bit. You're not just making Christ and the apostles liars, but it also extends into potentially destroying one's view of justification, it, destroying their understanding of how their sins could possibly be forgiven. Now, as I have mentioned a couple times, it also undermined the apostles' authority when these teachers were coming. The apostles were given the divine calling and divine authority from Christ himself to teach these things. You could say that the apostles were the original authorized version of the Bible, if you will. But needless to say that if someone is coming in and undermining their teaching and it's taking hold in the life of the church, chaos is going to is going to ensue. You have competing teachings going on. Who's telling the truth? Who's not telling the truth? Who am I going to side with here? Now, going back again to those who do not confess Christ as coming in the flesh as the deceiver and antichrist, there's another thing that we need to consider here. There's been lots of talk, if you're a Christian for any time in America, you've likely heard talk about the antichrist and who he is. We're not going to spend a lot of time here on this, but it is important to touch on what John is speaking about. Is he talking about a specific person? He's actually talking more about the spirit behind the person. Those that are coming as false teachers, because notice he goes from many deceivers in the plural, not to get too grammatical here, to then he's speaking specifically, such a one is a deceiver. He's not talking about a particular person that he has in mind. He's talking about those that are teaching this teaching. And behind that is an antichrist spirit. It's a spirit that opposes what Christ has taught, what Christ handed down to the apostles and they handed down. And what we get here, then, is another thing to consider. This is not just a matter of competing humans teaching. It's not teachers saying, no, I know what's right. My opinion's right. I have the truth. It goes beyond that. What we have here is spiritual warfare, in a sense. We have lies, deception being put forth to destroy the life of the church. And John understood that. And such, such as that, or because of that, he uses the strong language. Now, you might say, this feels a little out of date. This still feels like, you, me you know, you mentioned that back in history, the early heretics, all that. Do we see that today? Does that still exist in the church? Well, the reality is, we still have this particular issue in our church. Ligonier State of Theology survey that they do every couple of years uh, just put out their survey in the last couple of months for 2022. I pulled a couple of the statements that they put forth to people, and I'm going to give some of the results here. On the statement, Jesus is the first and the greatest cr being created by God. Only 18% of professing evangelicals strongly disagreed with that statement. That means 82% of evangelicals believe or are not sure that Christ is a created being. This is not true. That is not orthodox. Again, let me read the percentage. Only 18% of professing evangelicals got this right. A second example is, was the statement given, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Evangelicals, a little bit more here. 38% of evangelicals affirmed this statement and strongly agreed. There were 12% in the middle, but thankfully 50% rightly disagreed with this. 
So we're talking about a 50-50 split amongst those who are professing evangelicals not getting this right. What does this do? It serves to make us aware of the battlefield that we're on, the spiritual battlefield, if you will, the battlefield for the life of the church, however you want to frame it. We need to be aware of what's going on. And this is not even taking into account the issues of biblical authority. That is, is it from God? Is it inspired by God? Is it inerrant? We're not even talking about those issues. We're talking about a core issue of who Christ is. And still further, we're not even getting into the issues of the ethical and cultural things that are going on that are making inroads into the church, things that are against what is in Scripture. But with all this said, in our love for one another, our right understanding of the truth of all that we believe is foundational, along with being aware of the heresies and errors that are being taught. You cannot shrink back and live in a bubble. There's a preparedness, a vigilant that comes with loving one another. This is not to say that we're going, we should go off heresy hunting. There are those that are apt to do that. They want to go looking for every little thing just to be able to say that person's wrong. This is not at all what John's saying. This is not at all what I'm saying. But again, what this is saying is be awake of what's going on. And with this awareness, then, it leads us to considering more fully what is at stake. So point number, point number three here with awareness of the stakes. Or sorry, yeah, point number two with awareness of the stakes. Verses eight and nine, if you look, it says, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has the Father and the Son. The stakes here are ultimately our relationship with God, our salvation. A right belief from the right teaching is evidence that those people have the Father and the Son. When we step back and consider that, we see that the stakes are high. It's a life and death thing, quite literally, when we think about eternity and hell. But what does this awareness look like and how does it play out? Reading again from verse 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Right here gets to the heart of the matter and what is going on with false teachers when they're out there. The hearts do not have an interest in God or the kingdom of Christ. They're self-serving hearts. If you allow me just to read from words of Paul, another apostle, he gives us an insight into what was going on with some of these false teachers. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Now, I, I get that that's not John's words, but we know that within the apostolic circles from these words here, and it's in other epistles, that's just one example, we know that they were witnessing and seeing these things going on. They were able to piece together what this enemy looked like. So recapping between both of these, what do we have? We have those that are coming in, causing division, teaching contrary to the apostles' teaching. They do not serve the Lord, but they serve their own appetites. Another thing that's not specifically mentioned here, but there's evidence of this throughout history, is the idea that these men were going out, and this was about making a living. It was not about serving Christ. It was, how can I make a buck? How can I make money? The truth was not important to them. Do we not see those same traits today with false teachers? If we consider the prosperity gospel teachers that are out there, the televangelists that are out there, you get that with some mega church pastors, and also those who are trying to be voices of influence within Christianity. Do we not see that there's an appetite for money and high living? Is there not an appetite for fame and attention that exists, being in the spotlight? Is there not a pride and a stubbornness that is more important than the truth? All this does is to serve to make 
evilness and the rejection of God more apparent to us when we look at this and consider this. But the stakes go beyond just acknowledging these false teachers and the sinfulness of them. The real evil and wickedness that is going on when these things take place is the creation of stumbling blocks or roadblocks for one's faith and salvation. It's creating confusion, leading someone down the wrong path. Again, I remind you of what we're considering here, namely that a proper knowledge of Christ affects more than Christology. This is why this is imperative stuff still to this day. But let's flip it to the other side. Let's consider, though, what we have when we do have proper teaching. There is a joy for the believer. There's a joy in the gospel. Think about it every Sunday morning when we go through, and we do our liturgy too, where we confess the law, and then we have the assurance of forgiveness. What a joy it is to know the good news of the cross. You're loving one another when you're teaching the truth to each other. It is one way that this loving one another can be applied is by protecting each other. So shifting from understanding these stakes, we now get to the crux of what John is saying here. He's giving us an application of how to love one another, and that is rooted in protecting each other. This can be seen, as I said, for the third point, with awareness of actions. That is, are your actions loving or unloving to your neighbor? So John rounds out his words here uh, of this section in verses 10 and 11. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Isn't that odd for him to just say this after a few verses before he commanded them to love one another? It should cause us to pause. But what we know, and I've already laid it out, is that he's not talking out of both sides of his, of his mouth. No. What John is doing here is understanding the repercussions of what hosting and entertaining a false teacher brought. See, in the first century, to host a guest was a sign of favor for the guest not only from the guest or from the host to the guest, but it was also a symbol or a sign to everyone who would have seen this that, oh, okay, that person is deemed okay. Consider if you have an elder who's hosting and entertaining a false teacher. It's gonna cause a lot of questions. Even if the host disagreed with what this person was teaching, there was still already a seed planted and enough that was there to allow this false teaching to grow because it would have caused questions. So again, I go back to kind of how this works. They gain a tolerance, the false teachers that is. They gain a tolerance, they gain a hear, hearing of the people and the poison then spreads. And next thing you know, you have trouble on your hands. You have a church that is in shambles. So the question then is, is it really loving to expose your church and to host someone that is coming willfully teaching against Christ than not. True love, as John is instructing them here, is to protect each other and not let the false teaching take a hold in their church. Yes, it might be a bummer that this false teacher who's coming around is not going to be able to stay. But what's more important, one's salvation or not? I come from the evangelical world uh, before coming out to a Westminster uh, seminary. And in the evangelical world, there's this idea of niceness that is there. And it's really the niceness, uh, it reflects the culture, the broader culture that is. So with this idea is to disagree, confront, or even rebuke is considered not nice. The flip side being, okay, even if I disagree with you, I'm not going to be vocal about it. If I disagree with you, I'm not going to confront you. I'm not even going to rebuke you. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and try to be friends. 
By those standards, was John being nice in these instructions? No. You see, niceness in the world's eyes does not equate to loving your neighbor in God's eyes. Loving your neighbor in God's eyes is looking out for your brothers, making sure that they're growing up in the truth. Loving our children, which are, in a sense, our neighbors, catechizing them as they grow up. New members as they're coming into the church, catechizing them before they become members. Discipleship. All these things are versions of this idea of protecting each other from falseness. So as we kind of wind down, in this day and age, as Christ's church deals with heretical teachings and beliefs taking hold, as well as the cultural stuff that we didn't even touch on, and we don't have to, will we love one another and defend each other in the truth? Is the question. Or will we just let these waves surge and run us over? And brothers and sisters, sadly, it, it's gone on in other places where this has just surged. Now again, I'm not calling for us to be militant. That's not at all what John was calling for either. But what John was saying is if they come or when it comes, be willing to stand your ground and fight. And I don't mean fight and getting nasty, but I, I mean just holding the ground. John was calling them to love one another 